Friends, we come together on this Ash Wednesday in a time of chaos, seeking moments of wisdom in the circle of hope that is us. We come together as fellow human beings, seeking moments of grace from the one who loves us, despite often being disappointed with us. We come together seeking moments of peace that we can share with all in our world. There will be peace, poet David Roberts wrote in 1999, when attitudes change, when self-interest is seen as part of common interest, when old wrongs, old scores, old mistakes are deleted from the account, when the aim becomes cooperation and mutual benefit rather than revenge or seizing maximum personal or group gain, when justice and equality before the law becomes the basis of government, when basic freedoms exist, when leaders, political, religious, educational, and the police and the media wholeheartedly embrace the concepts of justice, equality, freedom, tolerance, and reconciliation as a basis for renewal, when parents teach their children new ways to think about people, there will be peace when enemies become fellow human beings. Our call to worship this morning comes from Isaiah 9, 2. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. And that brings to mind a uh, a poem, a fable that Aesop wrote in the 6th century BC titled, The Wind and the Sun. The wind and the sun were disputing which was the stronger. Suddenly, they saw a traveler coming down the road and the sun said, I see a way to, to decide our dispute. Whichever of us can cause that traveler to take off his cloak shall be regarded as the stronger. You begin. So the sun retired behind a cloud and the wind began to blow as hard as it could upon the traveler. But the harder he blew, the more closely did the traveler wrap his cloak around him till at last the wind had to give up in despair. Then the sun came out and shone in all its glory upon the traveler who soon found it too hot to walk with his cloak on and took it off. For you see, true strength is not bluster. Let's all mute, but join in singing when the storms of life are raging, which is also sometimes known as stand by me. Today, we're going to change the repeat line to stand by all. You can find When the Storms of Life Are Raging in the Brethren Blue Hymnal, number 558, but it's also going to be displayed for you there on your screens.
poetic reflection called Forgiveness is Divine by Pat A. Fleming. Some people view forgiveness as a virtue for the weak, an act of mercy undeserved that serves no useful need. They stand firmly in their judgment and won't consider a mistake. They prefer to hold a senseless grudge than accept amends when made. They feel they have some godly right to reject and criticize. They're possessed by righteous anger, consumed by pointless pride. They're focused on how they've been wronged and won't be made the fool again. So they feel they must avenge themselves by refusing to give in. They will sacrifice their family or forsake a longtime friend, do anything they have to to be the winner in the end. Or perhaps it's that they can't resolve the depth of all their hurt caused when someone that they've trusted left them questioning their worth. But no matter why the struggle, out of pride or out of fear, not being able to forgive can cause the loss of one's most dear. Yes, forgiveness is a virtue. They even say it is divine, but more than that, it sets you free from what weighs you down inside. Will you pray with me? Most holy God, we come to you with awe and wonder, aware of the mystery of life, reverent before your holy love and power. Sharpen our awareness of the sacred. Startle us with the joy of discipleship and strengthen us to accept the cost of following Jesus Christ. Amen. And now from our sacred scriptures, Isaiah 58. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. The Lord will guide you always. Today is the beginning of Lent. You probably all did your Mardi Gras partying last night or eating your Fosnots. <laughs> it's a 40 plus day journey of marking the time from Jesus beginning his ministry in the wilderness, culminating in Holy Week and Easter. Lent is not about having your best life now. It's about giving up what we want to focus on what God wants. Maybe why this is, this is why there's so little appropriation compared to Christmas and Easter. Setting aside time for self-reflection and self-deprivation is far less desirable than good old Saint Nick and the Easter Bunny. But you know, I'm a big proponent of suffering. Okay, all right. What I mean to say is that I'm always on the lookout for the ways in which suffering can serve me. It's telling me that something is amiss and that there's a divine lesson to be learned. And what I know about divine reality is that there is a pattern. The pattern Jesus reveals is the whole pattern of creation and human history in condensed form. Perhaps he's best seen as a map. Because of Jesus's life, death, and resurrection, we can see suffering, disappointment, disillusionment, absurdity, and even death as part of the plan. Resurrection and renewal are in fact the universal and observable pattern of everything. We accept this pattern in other realms like the seasons and life cycles, but never, not once, 
have, when trouble has come my way, have I said, oh, goody, goody, a time for growth and renewal. In the moment of trouble, it feels like muck. Life closes in, focus becomes fixed on the wrongness of the situation, defenses jump to the fore and suffering commences. But what if in the muck was the mystery? What if we had the awareness or guidance to seek the mystery in the muck? Lent may be the perfect time for this, a perfect time to reflect on one's life. We all have places in our life that are broken and incomplete. My first husband died when I was 29, leaving me with two young children. And grieving was complicated due to overwhelming hard financial hardships and the physical abuse that I needed to heal from. Finally, after some intense spiritual growth, 17 years later, I was able to bury the hatchet. All that time, I had been poised and waiting with my metaphorical hatchet to fight this man. I had been living in this muck for almost two decades. What I hadn't seen that in laying down my hatchet, I became free and accepted and honored the growth that this man had afforded me and lay claim to the truth of that relationship. And I had to come clean about the parts of that ugly marriage that were in here, in my being. This freedom and release became available for my children. This light became available for others who have suffered in ugly relationships. I was restored and made into something not just healed, but different from before. In the muck is the mystery. In the wound is the wonder. Again, hearing Isaiah, if you do away with the, woke, the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and the malicious talk, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. By holding on to my energetic hatchet, and yes, there is a cost to holding on to one's hatchet, the oppression of hate and fear and unworthiness yoked me, had me in bonds, kept me above owning my own part. It was so easy to make him the bad guy, leave it at that. It was so neat and tidy to put him in a little box, labeled and filed, never to be dealt with again. But to open up that box, pull out the muck, was a step into the generous graciousness of the living God. I expected darkness and ugliness to come from that box, but what jumped out once I was authentically present to all the pieces in it was freedom and love and gratitude. Well, you might say God came out of that ugly box for me. This reminds me of Zacchaeus. Once he had rectified himself with Jesus, he astonishingly found himself not a cheat, but a man of overflowing generosity, giving half of his belongings to the poor, repaying his cheating with four times the amount. Here, the oppressor was suffering, as well as those he oppressed. Suffering shoots from both ends of the gun. Zacchaeus's life was broken open before Jesus and he too was liberated from the oppression of status seeking, posturing and acquiring. Freedom became generosity and joy and community. Romans four tells us, the God who gives life to the dead 
and calls into being things that were not. Forgiveness and healing that happen through great love or great suffering is a transformative mystery. In the muck is the mystery. Perhaps we can best hear God's voice when we are low and meek. My spiritual mentor, Father Richard Rohr, advises us to seek one good humiliation a day. You see, I am a proponent for suffering. <laughs> Seeking a daily humiliation will undoubtedly keep you in the universal pattern of life and death and resurrection. We can do this day in and day out. When I am humiliated, I always ask myself, who or what is humiliated? It cannot be my God self. That is indestructible. It is always my ego, my false self that parades around as if she has it all together. The humiliation gives a nudge or sometimes a shove off my balance of life satisfaction, self-centeredness, and has me asking, what is true here, Lord? What is your will? How do I make amends? Will you forgive me? In the wound is the wonder. Anne was an awful woman who was nearing the end of her life. She was bitter and angry and manipulative and bossy. She had alienated her family and friends and tore through her caregivers like bubblegum. Somehow I got connected with her and was soon manipulated into a weekly visit. And I have never had a relationship such as this. This was a relationship without any ties. She was not a friend. She was not a family. I was not paid to sit with her. She was not connected to any institution I worked for. It was complete freedom. There's nothing I had to do to caretake that relationship. No strings attached. I had never had so much freedom with someone before. And truth be told, the task was distasteful. And I had my fingers crossed that she might kick me out. My one stipulation in sitting with her was that our time be committed to her spiritual growth and development. If she were interested in that, I would agree to come once a week. She said yes, and I got inducted into the small, controlled, anxiety-ridden, pain-filled world of Anne. She had a light sensitivity, so she could not go outside. Loud noises upset her. Fabrics inflamed her skin. Food was her enemy. And Jesus, well, he was far away and much less important than all the little details of living in the body of Anne. It took some time, but as Anne's body and will diminished, her ability to allow Jesus to come closer to her increased. She had an ongoing vision of her walking into a volcanic crater, circling and circling an enormous pit coming ever closer to the center of hot lava. Then Jesus began to appear on the other side of the crater and he was coming closer. She was sure it was him. In daily life, she complained that the caretakers didn't stay around. So I dove in. Why not? I asked. And I didn't let up until she saw that she was the cause of their leaving. I'll provide you an example. She wanted me to move an armchair. She's sitting in bed and she says, Julie, move that armchair a little to the left. So I move it to a, no, a little further out. No, now they've got it facing the wrong. Stop doing it wrong. But back more. <laughs> and I said, do you know that you are bossy? And she said, oh, I'm not bossy. I just like things the way I like things. And I said, what do you think it's like for people over here when you do that? Well, this was a startling new thought for her. 
So I gladly and effusively explained my experience. So we uncovered her obsessive bossiness, and her need for things to go her way, and wondered how this might have created anger and animosity toward her. We wondered if that had caused a rift between her and her estranged daughter. She had homework to do, a call to her brother to make amends that proved less than successful, but at least she got to say what she needed to say before she died. As she grew weaker, a mere 85 pounds, she again complained that she was no good at all, not worthy of even a breath. What? I asked, can't you even pray? Can't you applaud your caretaker's efforts on your behalf? You have plenty of power and influence. Use it. Use your last breaths for good. Her daughter was persuaded to visit and they came to resolution as she did with the rest of her family, phone call after phone call. Finally, in her dying, Anne was experiencing life. In her diminishment of her will, she experienced the resurrection of love and goodness that she had never known. Anne, an ill, suffering woman, was more alive in her dying than she had ever been in her living. Jesus was coming closer and closer to her in the crater. And at the end, he picked her up, her tired and worn body, and carried her the rest of the way. In the muck is the mystery, and in the wound is the wonder, and in the healing is the hallelujah. Amen. In a minute of silent reflection, I invite you to focus on the words that Julie just spoke to us today and on the tree that will be projected on your screen and ponder this particular question. In our world today, is it possible that Jesus is calling us all down from the tree? We pause for hope. The Coming of Light by Mark Strand. Even this late, it happens. The coming of love, the coming of light. You wake and the candles are lit as if by themselves. Stars gather and dreams pour into your pillows, sending up warm bouquets of air. Even this late, the bones of the body shine and tomorrow's dust flares into breath. Our closing hymn this morning is especially appropriate for these difficult times. As music director, uh, I get to um, lead this song quite a bit at the Canton, Illinois Church of the Brethren. If you are not already uh, familiar with the song, that's okay. Just either sing along or read the impactful words of this beautiful poetry by Lloyd Stone and Georgia Harkness. I warn you, I rarely make it through this song without tears.
A beautiful song, especially in terms of thinking of our friends and family and those of Ukraine. We will end with a benediction, which is a story you may be familiar with. Many years ago, people traveled far seeking a very wise old man who seemingly could answer questions that no one else could. One day, two young boys decided it would be fun to try and trick the old man. Well, let's, let's catch a bird and carry it in our hands to the old man, said one to the other. We shall ask him to tell us whether the bird is dead or alive. If the old man says it is dead, I'll just pry open my fingers and the bird will fly free. But what if the old man says it's alive, asked the other. Well, then I shall crush it and it will be dead. The first boy smiled cunningly. That afternoon, the two approached the old man who was sitting quietly on the branch of an old oak tree. Wise one, said the boy, reaching his arm upward. This bird I hold, is it alive or is it dead? The old man took his time searching the eyes of his young inquisitors. He stepped down out of the sturdy tree, smiled, and as he turned to go said, it is in your hands. In the muck is the mystery, in the wound is the wonder, in the healing is the hallelujah, amen.